All right, thank you, Haley. Uh, one quick thing before I dive into some youth stuff is we, so this Friday, we, the Boomer, what, what is it, Ruth? What's the official title? Yeah, the Boomers. So they are having a near the pool party, not in the pool party, by the water, or in the pool, pool optional. Um, anyways, <laughs> so that is going to be at John and Jennifer Emke's house. Go ahead and take some, uh, or <clears throat> details in the bulletin. Check that out. Uh, so last thing I want to talk about today is Mission Longview. So Mission Longview is something that we did last week. I took five junior high kids all around Longview, and uh, we did service projects. We went to Dream Center. We went to House of Hope. And on the last day, we packed some lunches for Bailey Elementary when they get back into school. So what I absolutely love about Mission Longview is that even though the world, I would say, kind of been a little crazy the last two years and international missions have been hard, doesn't mean that we can't serve here locally. And I love getting the kids involved, and it's not some super giant trip, and we get to go home every night, which is nice. But uh, I absolutely love Mission Longview, and it's been a great experience. One of my favorite things was, uh, was House of Hope. You know, we were able to go there. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things was House of Hope. We were able to go there, serve the women lunch, and uh, just get to know them a little bit better, hear about their stories. And um, one thing I absolutely, the, the ministry really struck home to me is that these women have nowhere else to go. This is their last stop. This is where they're at. And just to hear the cheerful nature and being, you know, just telling us what it's going on in their life, hearing some funny stories and all that stuff. It, is, it was an absolutely wonderful experience, and it meant so much for us to go and impact them. So um, that, is, that was Mission Longview, and uh, I'm super excited. To, it was really the first thing as we kick off the summer for youth, and I'm excited for Tanglewood next week, and then we got CLY next month. So uh, love and summer so far. Let me go ahead and pray, and we will worship. Father God, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity for us to come together and praise you, God, that even for just a few minutes this morning, we can put the troubles of the day, troubles of the week aside, troubles of the outside world, and that we can really focus in on you, God, that we can worship you and love you just as much as you loved us. So God, thank you for this day, and let's focus in on you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as worship. I was walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the highlight, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. Then I saw lightning from heaven, and I've never been the same. Come on, shout it out. I'm gonna climb a mountain.
God, you were walking with us in the valley and on that highest mountain. And we think we couldn't go any further lower. God, you've never left us. You are so good and gracious. And for us to just have faith in knowing that your love endures forever, and it's only because of that sacrificial love. You sent your one and only begotten Son, Lord Jesus, and you died on the cross, a love so pure and so gentle. And we rest in knowing that we are your child. We are heirs to the throne, and your love will endure forever. It's in Jesus' precious name. that we used in the song say his love endures forever so is everything I read please respond his love endures forever Psalm 136 give thanks to the Lord for he is good give thanks to the God of gods give thanks to the Lord of Lords to him who alone does great wonders who by his understanding made the heavens, who spread out the earth upon the waters, who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night, to him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them, With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea. And brought Israel through the midst of it. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down the great kings and killed mighty kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their lands as an inheritance, an inheritance to his servant Israel. He reminded us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature and gives to the God of heaven. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Says 
so many, so many problems. But Lord, we can come to you knowing that there is true hope. Hope through your son that he has done on the cross for us so many years ago. So Father, we come with thankful hearts, with praise that you are, you are the son of the living God. We love you. We thank you in Christ, precious and holy name we pray this. Hi, everyone. Good to see you here today. We're going to jump into Acts chapter 13 today after dealing really with the whole narrative of chapter 12 last week, but to do a little uh, kind of catch up. So we're going to start here in verse 13, but those first 12 verses are, uh, are pretty big. A lot of big stuff happens. So Paul and Barnabas, they've been uh, working in the city of Antioch 
in Syria and where you know Christians are labeled Christians for the first time, and they get kind of the call from God to go to a different place. They're going to go to, to the island of Cyprus. That's where Barnabas is from. And so they're called to go to the island of Cyprus because there's a guy there named Sergius Paulus who's going to hear the gospel. And so they go, but in the journey, once they get to the island of Cyprus, they have a confrontation with a false prophet. And this false prophet is really trying to lead Sergius Paulus astray and all that. Well, it gets to the point of this confrontation between Paul and this false prophet. And he, in prophetic voice, essentially says, you've been encouraging this guy to walk in darkness, so you're going to walk in darkness the rest of your life. A guy who understood what it was to be struck blind pronounces that the false prophet is going to be struck blind. And so he is blind afterwards. So that's what happened in the first 12 verses. Incidentally, we get the note there, the little note there, the one verse note that Saul of Tarsus now is going by the name Paul. So just like that, we now are dealing with Paul. So Paul and Barnabas, they're getting ready for the next stage of the journey. They again are called to go to the next spot where God is going to use them as his chosen instruments. They're going to go back on another missionary journey. They're going to end up in another city named Antioch. It's a different Antioch, this one in Pisidia, but this is where they're going. So today, we're going to dive into the text. But before we do, we have a takeaway, and it's this, as it's fairly typical for us, um, God is no stranger to history. God is no stranger to history. This is the biggest, like, minimized statement in the world. Sometimes we want to compartmentalize things in our life. My life is my life, and I'm doing things in my life, and I'm in control of this little, uh, you know, world and universe, and I have to do everything by my own strength, by my own wisdom, by all of this, but God is still moving, and God is still doing things, and sometimes we have these opportunities to do great things in submission to the kingdom, and sometimes we feel like we are on our own. Any kind of mix of things is true to life, but God is no stranger to history. He's no stranger to his story. So we'll see this play out in the text today. All right, I'm going to pick up reading in verse 13. You can follow along with me in a paper Bible on a smart device on these screens up front or on your screens at home. They all work for me. Here we go, 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel, the prophet. They asked for a king, and God gave them Saul son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom God testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And John, as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers and sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, they fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. We'll stop there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you, dear God, for a chance to gather now around the table of your word, and we pray that you be with us. Father, we ask that you open up our hearts and minds, help us to see and deal with the truth that you would have for us today. 
Father, amidst all potential distractions and things we have going on, projects at the house and the backyard and things looming on Monday, we pray now, God, today that you be here and near and that we just focus in and this time just be about you and your word and what you might have for us. We pray, dear God, that your spirit move. We love you. We thank you for your son. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's start there in verses 13 and 14. Let's take those two together. Now, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. Now, what we have here is a bit of a transition. So Luke is doing a couple of things with these verses. Paul now is really coming to the foreground. Before, Barnabas was really the heavy hitter in the duo. Barnabas was that guy who was that son of encouragement that everybody wanted to, you know, be around. And everyone wants a friend like Barnabas. He's the guy that handwrites all the long birthday cards and makes sure you get it like the day before your birthday, that type of deal. He never forgets to text you. He always emails with you and emails you within 24 hours. That's Barnabas. Barnabas is the son of encouragement. He's the guy that the apostles met in Jerusalem. It's like, no, this guy is someone special. This ain't Joseph of Cyprus anymore. This is Barnabas. He's the son of encouragement. Barnabas was the heavy hitter in the group. But now Paul is put forward. Barnabas is still the encourager. He's still going to do Barnabas things. But as an encourager, he's fine being in the background. Luke lets us know very subtly with verse 13, now Paul and his companions. Paul is going to the foreground. We are told through the narrative with Ananias when God appeared to him in a vision, I got this guy named Saul. He's my chosen instrument. Are you sure, God? Yes, I am sure. Now we really see that chosen instrument being put to the foreground. Now Paul and his companions, they set sail from Paphos. So they had been on the island of Cyprus. That's, that's Barnabas' hometown. They had that confrontation with the false prophet. They preached the gospel to Sergius Paulus, the Roman proconsul there on the island. And, and, he, and he believes. And so after that, they set sail from Cyprus and sail due north. They're going to Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. They land in Perga, but before they set sail, John Mark leaves. We don't really get a sense here of just how big of a deal this is, but this is that first little bit of fracture that takes place between Paul and Barnabas. This, we can call it the first church split if you want to, if it makes us feel better about ourselves. So this is like the thing that happened that caused the first church split. John Mark, whether it be because he's just homesick or he wants to get back to Jerusalem, he needs to go listen to more of Peter's sermons because he's going to write them down one day. All of that, no matter what's going on there, he wants to go back to Jerusalem. And so Paul and Barnabas, they set sail together. They're going to sail due north. They're going to end up in the... Antioch of Pisidia because God has something he wants him to do there. And so they go. John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So, they're given the opportunity to preach in the synagogue. This is kind of a big deal because the synagogue there, um, it's big enough to where the ruler of the synagogue or rulers of the synagogue, they like send a message to Paul and Barnabas. Like there's, this is not like people gathered in a room like this and they casually pass a note around. There's something, this is kind of a big deal that these two guys, and maybe it was their reputation preceded them because Paul, we know that he had been evangelizing in Tarsus in the province of Cilicia, which is just to the east of where they are right now. Uh, we know that Barnabas is a guy who with a name in the church. People know that he's a son of encouragement. So maybe their reputation precedes them. But we also know that Sergius Paulus has family in the area around Antioch of Pisidia. Maybe he drafts a letter for them 
of introduction to the synagogue there. Because you know, we know he's well thought of, and whatever it is, whether it be influence, whether it be reputation, we know that Paul and Barnabas have the opportunity to preach in the synagogue. What's so cool about that is where Antioch is located. It's in the Roman province of Galatia. So think about this. So some of the people sitting in this room will one day read Paul's letter to the Galatians, which is awesome. So Paul, he has the opportunity to preach Jesus in this, in this synagogue there by invitation to people that he's going to have a pastoral relationship one day down the road. It's just absolutely awesome. So on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. This was, this was their habit. This is what they did. When they went to a new place, they went to go hear the word being read aloud on the Sabbath. And after the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. The rulers of the synagogue used the title brothers to them. And so they acknowledge the shared history. Paul is also going to acknowledge the shared history here in a moment as well. And so there is a sense of connection here underneath the umbrella of the children of Abraham that we need to make sure we don't miss. Verse 16, so Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. There's no hesitation within Paul at all. You just see him like leap out of the chair at the opportunity to get to speak, to get to preach in the synagogue, to offer this word of encouragement. He's doing a lot more than encourage these people. He wants them to know and understand Jesus the way that he knows and understands Jesus. So he leaps out of his chair and he motions with his hand. So this is a guy who uses every bit of his pharisaical training in the earliest days of his life and every bit of his Roman rhetorical know-how to make a point here. Look at his words. Look at what he does here. Men of Israel and you who fear God. Even the way he begins his sermon, it's intentional. And it feels big too. Think about Abraham Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago. Our forefathers put forth on this continent to birth a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Think about Shakespeare and the way that he records or imagines Mark Antony addressing the Roman Senate. Roman Senate. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Paul, to those in Antioch, men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. This feels big. It feels like he's calling them to something to respond in a very profound moment. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. <laughs> More on that in just a second. The God of this people, Israel. It's interesting that he begins to recount pieces of the Moses narrative. And the name of Moses is mentioned not at all in this chapter. This is not about a guy who had a, an amazing and dynamic life who was used as a, as a chosen instrument of God to be God's man in the moment and do great things and stand before Pharaoh, who was a great military leader in his early life and then went into the wilderness for 40 years and learned what it was to be humble and prostrate before a holy God and then go back in service after he pushed back and did not want to serve. This is not about that at all. What Paul is keen to put on display is that God is doing something. God has been doing something. And yes, he may have chosen instruments in the various moments of life, but it's not about Moses at all. When Israel, when they left Egypt and crossed through the Red Sea, it wasn't because Moses raised his staff over the waters, it's because God raised his arm. That's the focus, that's the emphasis. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. God chose the ancestors, going all the way back to Abraham. He was nothing special. You could even say he was a bit of a failure to launch. 
Because he's a guy living in his father's house in Ur. When are you going to get a job and get out, kid? You're bothering me. I want to live the empty nester life, that type of deal. God says go. He finally does. But it's not like he's a good guy. He has this habit of like marrying off his wife for his personal financial benefit. Jacob is a liar and a cheat. Joseph is a bit of a weasel, at least in his early years. There's nothing special about these guys other than God is doing something with and in them and through them. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great. He made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. With an uplifted arm, he led them out. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. It reads just as it sounds. Their sin was real. They needed to be dealt with. He put up with them. But this is like looking back on the story and looking back, um, seeing how God has moved in and through it. And you can kind of smile about it a little bit. You know, I have a friend of mine, very good friend of mine. I'd do anything, anything for this guy. I don't know whether or not he is the worst, best person ever or the best, worst person ever. <laughs> The line in between those is just so very thin. He would simultaneously do absolutely anything for you, give you the shirt off your back, and be there by your side in your, in your worst moments, and then tell the worst stories about you, embellishing the truth, crafting this narrative that just, you know, all for a laugh. I don't know which one he is. But I look back and, you know, tell the story of those moments, and, and it's fine. Paul is looking back and he can say now to the people gathered there in the synagogue who have just heard the law read aloud, who have just heard the prophet, prophets read aloud, he can say, well, God put up with them for 40 years in the wilderness. And I imagine some of them may have chuckled as well. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance and all this took about 450 years, and after that he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. He's building up, he's reciting a fast version of the narrative. He brought them into the land of promise. He gave them the land of promise. And they didn't take the land by any strength and military skill of their own. No, this was something God did. It's not strength and military skill that causes the walls of Jericho to fall, marching around seven times and blowing trumpets. That's not what it is. God is doing something. God was doing something. And the people are to respond to it. God is doing something. He really is doing something. And he's giving them the opportunity to respond to what he is doing. All this took place about, over about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. All of this took place in time and space, over a season. And he gave them judges to, to keep them on the right track along the way, to rise up and to, to take care of them until the days of Samuel. And Samuel's a different animal altogether. Kind of a transitional figure. He's a prophet. He speaks God's truth. He delivers the word of God. It's not good enough for the people. They asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. You want a king? You want to be just like everybody else? I'll give you a king like everybody else. Saul, it said, stood head and shoulders above everybody else. I imagine him to be a, a tall, you know, strong, Gaston-like figure. He looks like he should be king. He probably sings and all that kind of stuff as well. But he looks the part, right? He looks the part. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be like everybody else. But he's not not the right guy. When the announcement was made, he was hiding in the luggage. He was scared. He's no character. When Goliath is bellowing from the battlefield, he's cowering in the tent. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king. 
of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. The story of David, the selection of David, could not be more difficult. Remember Saul, he, or uh, Samuel, he goes to anoint David. Goes to Jesse's house. Jesse's not a big deal either. But even the house of God, who's not a big deal, David is like the least of the house that's not a big deal. One brother after another is paraded before the prophet. You got anybody else? You got anybody else? You got anybody else? You got anybody else? And eventually Jesse's like, well, I got the kid out there in the field. He's not even worth bringing in for a potential like anointment for his older brother being king. That's how much Jesse thought of his youngest son, David. So they call him in. So I got it. It's a little ruddy, whatever that means. And Samuel anoints him. God has found something within David. He's not perfect, but God has found something within David. A heart that's like his. A man after my own heart. And imagine this being spoken in a very Gentile, a very Roman world there in Antioch, in Pisidia, in the Galatian province, when it says that David had a heart like God's. Because heart's a big deal. Heart's a big word to the ancients, especially ancients with a little bit of Greek culture. The heart is the center of a person. The heart is the thing that filters what's, what the mind brings in and all of its calculations. The heart is the thing that filters the impulses of the gut and restrains those lesser versions of ourselves. No, I thought that, but I'm not going to do that. I may have thought it, but I'm not going to do it. The heart is the thing that pulls us back and makes us who we are. And that's why when God says, I'm going to write my covenant on your heart, it's so incredibly important. It's a very, very big deal. God says, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And it's of this man's offspring. Of this man's offspring. The one who will do my will. God has brought to Israel a savior. Jesus, as he promised. As he promised. This is appealing to that messianic expectation. This is appealing to that anticipation that one day, one day, one day, God is going to bring a leader like David. He's going to have a heart like David, but he's going to be better than David. He's going to establish a kingdom that's going to have no end. And he's going to you know, sit on David's throne again in David's city. And the temple of fires are going to be roaring again. And, and everyone is going to worship the Lord. This is that idea that Paul is appealing to as he's speaking to those gathered on the Sabbath day after hearing the law and the prophets read that it's through the descendant of David, this person, Jesus, that God has brought salvation into the world. Now, this is where he starts to step dance all over the toes of those who are gathered. The ancestor, or David's descendant, Jesus, brings salvation. And I'll, I'll go you one better. Verse 24. Before his coming, before his coming, to prepare people for his coming. John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as, uh, as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. What I love here, that, so I have moments as I'm like reading through scripture and studying um, throughout the week where I'm just kind of like, you know, I didn't, I've never thought about that before. There's zero introduction of John the Baptist here. Zero introduction of John the Baptist to those who are gathered in the synagogue hundreds of miles from the place where John was baptizing in the Jordan River. No need to introduce. You have to wonder about how well John was known and the significance of what he was doing. And the questions that might have been rising in people's minds as this crazy ascetic guy from the wilderness who's subsisting on, you know, locusts and honey from the wilderness, who's calling people to repentance, who's baptizing people in the Jordan River, who's preparing people, who's calling people to this 
sense of rededication, but not a rededication to him and his message, but it's a rededication to the things of God and this anticipation that God is about to do something. He didn't fit the bill of the Messiah. The thinking about the Messiah was still this idea that's going to sit on the throne. It's going to come riding in on a war horse. That's going to raise up the armies of God and send the Romans packing. But if he's not that type of guy, there are some, if he's not that type of guy, there's some who might wonder, it's like, well, maybe he is this re- religious ascetic type guy. John's doing something big. John's doing something special. We have a lot of questions about him. People seem to respond. People are, are, are going to him to receive this baptism of repentance. I wonder if he might be the one that we're anticipating. We don't know how much John knew about his own purpose, like called purpose in the grand scheme of things. We don't know if Zechariah, his dad, we don't know if Zechariah told him everything that the angel revealed to him. We don't know if John had his own moment with God. It's like, all right, you're going to make straight the paths. You're going to be that voice calling out into the wilderness. We don't know any of those things, but we do know that John was preparing. We do know that John was calling people forth to repentance. We do know that he knew enough about himself to say, I ain't the one. But I tell you, the one who's coming, you haven't seen nothing yet. As good as you think I am, I am completely unworthy to untie his sandals. The lowest rung in the ancient Roman household, the slave who was being punished, that's who you made handle the shoes. That's who you made wash the feet. That's who you made do all of those things because you wanted to make a point. You wanted to make an example of them. I'm not even worthy of being the one who's punished in the house of the Messiah. That was John's view of self. What do you suppose I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Verse 26. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. Verse 26. Again, a bit of the ramp up. You know, he started with the whole friends, Romans, countrymen thing. Brothers and you who fear God, listen, listen, listen. Lean in. This is big and it's important. Don't miss this. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham. Brothers, this connection that we have. You greeted us as brothers before. I am greeting you as a brother now. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham. Appealing to the grand history of God. Interacting and using his chosen instruments in the people of God. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham. And you who fear God. Whether you are a brother because of what your Ancestry.com says or you are a brother because you have committed yourself to getting as close as you can to the living God based on what you have found in his word and you just can't be held back anymore. And for whatever reason, you haven't been able to take the steps to become a full member of the Israelite community. All of you who are gathered, who fear God, I'm talking to you too. To us has been sent the message of this salvation. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the way that this is revealed through the word to people who have been seated in a room listening to the word. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath fulfilled, by, uh, fulfilled them by condemning him. Those who are gathered in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's where the holy people are, y'all. We're just out here on the fringes. We're so far away in the synagogue, but that's where the holy people are. They're in Jerusalem. They're close to the temple. The place where sacrifices are offered where the high priest presides over everything where the word is studied where the best teachers go to teach the word 
Where even little guys from Tarsus go to study under great minds like Gamaliel. There at that place, they didn't recognize him. At that place in Jerusalem, they didn't recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets at a place where the prophets themselves spoke, at a place where in the synagogue the prophets are read, in a room right after the law and the prophets were read, Paul says to those gathered who made the decision to gather and worship that they didn't understand the prophets at the place where the prophets ministered, which are read every Sabbath. They fulfilled them by condemning Jesus. You can't help but think about maybe Paul's mind, maybe Barnabas' mind, maybe the mind of those who are with them, maybe those who are gathered in the room there as Paul is uh, launching into this sermon as Jesus as the fulfillment of the, uh, of the greatest hopes of the Old Testament, the fulfillment of the, this heir of David's, uh, of David's son. You can't help but if like prophetic words comes leaping up in their mind you can't help but think are they thinking about isaiah 53 right now are they thinking in their own mind you know i wonder for he grew up before him like a young plant like a root out of dry ground he had no form or majesty that we should look at him no beauty that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces he was despised and we esteemed him not surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by god and afflicted he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed are they thinking about those things As Paul's talking about the way they missed it in Jerusalem. After they themselves read the word of prof- the word of the prophets that morning. Have they missed it? Are they starting to put pieces together as Paul is in the preamble of his sermon, as he's introducing, as re- he's asking that they recall their own history. Although they found in him no guilt worthy of death. They asked Pilate to have him executed. They fulfilled the word without understanding, without knowing that they were fulfilling the prophetic word. They had a picture of what was true. But something else was true. You know, truth is an idea that we um, are pretty passionate about. You know, there's a phrase that's been around forever in several different versions. A, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth even gets out of bed. Or as Winston Churchill said, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on or shoes on, as Mark Twain said. There's a lot of versions of it. It's an idea that's as old as the garden and as new as a courtroom in Virginia, according to a jury of peers. Truth is a big thing that we hold on to. There are certain things that are, there are others that are not. The truth is very important, and that has not changed. Even like fictional worlds, we still want there to be truth. Authors can construct narratives and whole other universes and tell stories with made-up characters and make-believe places. But if there's an assault to truth in there, In a make-believe world, if there's an assault to the idea of truth, that even makes us bristle. We don't like it. We don't like when someone is mistreated because of a lie. Even the meek of us will, even the meekest of us will cry, well, that's not fair. Someone needs to do something. And so we come alongside or we, uh, (laughs) we weep with those who weep or set ourselves to be the one who actually fixes the problem or something like that. There are things truth we're willing to go to bat for. This morning we started with a takeaway. God is no stranger to history. God is no stranger to his story. Paul and Barnabas, they set sail from Cyprus north. 
they landed in Perga and they started, they made their way up to Antioch. Whether it's by reputation, they were welcomed to the synagogue, or whether it was by a letter of introduction, by a powerful figure, they were given the opportunity to deliver truth. After the law was read, after the prophets were read, and that reading there on the Sabbath day, they were given the opportunity. Do you have any word of encouragement? Paul can't wait to jump up. I've got a word of encouragement. He was someone who supremely knew what it was to believe at the deepest core of what it is to believe an idea but then be confronted with missing the boat on a scale that dwarfs anything we could imagine. Brothers, brothers, members of the family of Abraham, and all the rest of you who fear God, I have something you have to know. He tells about the great things that God had done through his chosen instruments throughout the history Talks, he alludes to Abraham and God's blessing through him. He alludes to the patriarchs and the way that God's blessing even in spite of them. He goes all the way back to Egypt and how God delivered them, not through the staff of Moses, but with God's own outstretched arm. Points to the faithfulness of God in the wilderness, putting up with them for 40 years clearing out the land of promise as an inheritance for them, letting them arrive at the natural conclusions of their actions when they want a king so they can be like everyone else. He gave them a king that was just like everyone else. But then David. Thread of redemption is woven through. A man after God's own heart. And it was in David's descendant that God continues to weave this plan of salvation. It was in Jesus. It doesn't use these exact words, but you might have heard other things about Jesus. You might have heard other things about John who was trying to prepare a way. You might have heard a lot of things, but I want you to know the truth. Because the truth is big and the truth is important. And the truth is salvation. God is all up in the middle of his story. And he wants you to see it. What it's doing right now. The Longview Christian Church, we practice communion weekly and with an open table. If you're a guest with us here for the first, second, third, fiftieth time, We have elements right there on that back table. I'll pray here in a moment. It'll be a great time to go snag them if you missed them on the way in. But we practice communion weekly as those those whose lives have been transformed by Jesus. In our own imperfection, sometimes we are reminded of our imperfection and being reconciled to the sacrifice of Jesus can hit like a truck, but that's what we need in those moments. Sometimes it's an encouragement. Because the world has hit like a truck and we're trying to keep our head above water. Communion has a great way of fulfilling a lot of ends like that. This morning I want to read from John chapter 9. Because I think it works really well and because a friend posted it on Facebook who's going through some stuff. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming, the one when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. God has been doing stuff for a very long time. Those threads and those evidences are all around. We need only to open up our eyes to see. We need only to remember what happened yesterday or the day before to see the faithfulness of God. But sometimes that can also be incredibly difficult because sometimes we're told untrue things, maybe even by ourselves. 
and we miss those opportunities to see those dynamic workings of God, and we just need to take a moment. Say, no, I know what's true and I know what's not. That through Jesus there is salvation. And that his chosen instruments are called to do things along the way. I may not understand and I may not know or I may not understand why and I may not know why. I may never understand or know why. But I do know I'm right here and I know that Jesus in him is salvation. And that may be the only thing I know. That's okay for today. And hopefully God brings us to a spot where we can say, with all honesty, that's okay for today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning. A chance to gather, to offer up our, our songs of praise to you, dear God, to come to you in prayer, to the God who hears us, Father, to walk through the your word. We're so very blessed. I pray now, dear God, that by your spirit, you help us to respond to your leading. That the reality we find ourselves is not constructed by our own best efforts, but is a gift from your hand. Sometimes that's hard to see. You have us in these moments. And through us, we can, through you, we can bring you glory, dear God. Help us to see you moving. Help us to rely on your truth in those moments where we can't see you moving. We love you. We thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Thank you.